Mugshart International presents Fresh Talk, conversations about creativity in the 21st century. I'm Kathy Bird, Fresh Art producer. This episode of Fresh Talk, recorded in Kassel, Germany, features Swiss artist Christian Philipp Müller, a participant in Documenta 13. Christian lives in Berlin and Kassel, where since 2011, He's been dean at the School of Art and Design. He has a history with this international exhibition, having participated in Documenta 10 in 1997. For Documenta 13, Christian created the project called Swiss Chard Ferry that we'll talk about today. I'm very curious about why Swiss Chard? Why this project? When I found out that I would become the dean of this or director of this school and at the same time also um, uh, when I got the invitation to participate as an artist for this documenta, uh, uh, the initial idea too was, was trying to establish a connection or a link between documenta as an event, as a monumental show that only takes place every five years and the school and pedagogy. So what I did was uh, establish a temporary shortcut between the side of pedagogy and the side of pleasure. One has to know that where we now sit uh, and where, what, where the campus is of the School of Art and Design, there used to be the kitchen or vegetable garden for the court. And uh, on the other side of the canal, that is called Kitchen Canal, there used to be, or still is, a pleasure garden where nobody did grow anything to nourish anybody. It was pure aesthetic pleasure. And I was uh, picking uh, the variety of Swiss chard, number one, because I was intrigued that a vegetable would have a connection to a nation, so why is chart Swiss and why is it not Turkish or Russian or Chinese or Arab chart or could be anything. And I got very curious to see if I could get samples or seeds of chart from around the world. And with the help of a student of the Department of Agriculture of the University of Kassel, uh, we were quite successful and established over 60 varieties. Caroline had um, not just different uh, points of interest or uh, kind of concentrations and sites within Documenta 13 where she would talk about certain topics, but she also had a main theme, collapse and recovery. Okay, so the subtitle of this piece is that the Russians don't cross the Fulda River anymore. Because I remember my visit uh, to Kassel, uh, my first visit in 1977, where the presence of the communism and the border between East and West Germany was very much felt in Kassel. Whereas Kassel is now in the center of Germany, it used to be very much on the edge, cut off from the rest. So this goes very well also with her theme. Absolutely. So these are really reminders of the Cold War. And um, I was told uh, so many stories that the Fulda River was full of mines, so that if the Russians tried to cross, you know, there would be uh, ways to just you know slow them down I would at say, least slow yes. them down you know when you talked about your role here as the director of the school how did you involve the school itself the students in your project I didn't involve them in my project I uh, worked with the Department of Agriculture uh, which is also part of the university but what I did here at the school was uh, running a seminar, uh, if you want to call it making of Documenta 13, where I invited Ben Leifeld, the CEO. Of course, number one was Carolyn herself. Then I had uh, Adam Kleiman and Julia Moritz of Maybe Be Education. Then I had the uh, head of production, head of publishing, uh, 
department of communication, every single role that made this huge show possible. So the students would understand that art does not fall from the sky, but, but instead many, many people make it possible. It seemed to me that based on uh, talking to people the day of the Swiss Start Tasting, that there were a lot of people here, 500 people attended the tasting that you staged here next to the barges, and there were a lot of people from Kassel here. One can say the population of Kassel is extremely proud of this show, and I don't know any other city where the population embraces such a big event in such a way, like here in Kassel, people embrace uh, Documenta. So for instance, in Venice, uh, people living there, they don't, you know, are very interested in Biennale of Venice, because, you know, there's always tourists in Venice, and whereas in Kassel, you know, this show takes place every five years, and the hotels, the restaurants, the stores are extremely packed during those 100 days. Mm -hmm. And not just during the 100 days, you have a huge growth of population of young intellectuals, young academics, students, uh, producers, they all make this show possible. So uh, that about, I would say, two years before uh, such a document opens its doors, um, the people start to you know, come in, in really in, in first in the tens, then in the hundreds, and then it just and it just keeps growing. And uh, this uh, document is really the motor of this city. It has been now. There's other industries. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, economy is not so bad, I would say. But uh, before, you know, every five years, this uh, show was you know making life in Castle possible. I would go so far. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with all the kinds of Swiss chard that you served at the tasting? We got uh, 44 uh, different seeds from around the world, from commercial seed companies. They are all um, organic and no hybrid seeds. That means they're pure, they're um, stable seeds so they don't change uh, their forms and they're they're commercially available but we also had 16 varieties where the seed bank uh, here in germany in got the ipk got the sleep and they didn't know how these plants would look much less how they would taste mm -hmm. and uh, i was just you know curious to find you know the link between the wild forms because the, the uh, Beta vulgaris, the chart, derives from the Beta maritima, which is a salt marsh plant that you can find even on the German island that's in the north of Germany called Helgoland, but you can also find it all around the Mediterranean in wild forms. And one says that the Greeks and the Romans have cultivated these plants. What I did find in the University Library in Basel is the uh, book that was printed by Johannes John Bohin in the 1650s, uh, where he uh, describes and uh, shows on woodcuts eight different varieties of chard. Swiss chard was considered a poor man's vegetable. And if you go around the stores in Germany or maybe I would say Europe, you don't find it easily commercially on supermarket shelves. Where you find it is on farmers markets. But when I, I go around and ask uh, people running those markets or those uh, market stands and I ask them if they know the names of their chart, they don't, but they know the names of many other things that they have for sale, but the chart is always without a name. And uh, here you have over 60 varieties and they all have a name. That's so cool. And uh, it's just, um, I think it's so funny that you, that you can uh, prepare a vegetable that's called pot of gold or El Dorado or Discovery or pink lipstick or uh, magenta sunset or um, bright orange and this 
uh, work also reflects the fact that since the Renaissance in gardens in Europe, the chart has been planted not just in vegetable gardens, but also in ornamental gardens for its very colorful forms and shapes. So chard was uh, for over hundreds of years already grown just for its decorative purposes and not for its nourishing values. When you have the poor man's vegetable, uh, that's in a way the kind of general understanding of this vegetable still in Germany, but you have for instance, uh, my friends from LA, they said that it's very much uh, like kale. Chard is now the in vegetable that you buy on the farmer's markets in California. And uh, I know it myself from living in New York for a very long time that the charts are very, very popular in the high-end restaurants and all the chefs that do their um, shopping on Union Square Market. That's what they're looking for, chart varieties. And uh, I was in London at a garden conference invited by Hans Ulrich Obricht at the Serpentine last uh, fall. And at this occasion, I had the chance to eat at one of the restaurants of uh, Jotam Ottolenghi. And uh, Jotam Ottolenghi, which uh, he's, uh, he's an uh, Israeli chef, uh, born in Tel Aviv in '68, but he is, uh, one can say a celebrity in London or in the UK. His cookbooks are um, topping the charts. And uh, there I ate and I saw many, many, many dishes prepared with chart. I bought the, his uh, book called Plenty and there he explains that chart is his favorite vegetable of all times. Uh, chart has now become super uh, much in demand in, in Britain, in the UK, and uh, the kind of recipes reflect this. So they they range from the top of the line, from celebrity chefs using this nearly forgotten vegetable, all the way down to the cookbook of my mother that uh, she uh, used uh, since she was in school. The book dates from 1942, so even in times of war there was nothing around. You could still prepare uh, recipes. Uh, you could still have chard. Chard is very easy to grow, and uh, it, it basically the all the warm month up up to the first frost or the first fall of snow, you can always harvest. Mm -hmm. Even if even if there's one or two inches of snow, you can still harvest the chard. So tell me which recipes were served the other day. A dish that's very easy to, to prepare is, for instance, a Swiss, a Swiss chard quiche. That would be like coming from the kind of French culture. Uh, we also had um, a recipe suggested by one of, of our interns coming from Tuscany. She received some recipes from her mother and grandmother. And that was um, octopus served with Swiss chard. My friend from Basel who visited over the weekend said she was just in uh, Croatia and in Croatia the main dish, uh, main vegetable served with seafood is chard. Hmm. Um, and uh, basically... Uh, you are so avant-garde <laughs> with this project. It's just, it's just so, it's just so much fun. So after this project, I hear the the barges will go away. What will happen to the Swiss chard that's sitting out there in front of us right now? This is a very good question. What happens after such a major event? Uh, you know, will the art be taken away immediately? It's not just like in the museum where you can take the paintings from the wall, you put them in the crates, and you send them back to the where they came from. Here, basically. Um, I tried to do a sustainable work of art. That means the barges go back where they came from and the wood will be used by the construction team that worked for Documenta, the soil and the chart will be composted. And uh, what else is there? A little bit of steel, the kind of railings that uh, will also be recycled. So there will be nothing left. What would you like to have come of this project? I mean, when I found out or when I was told that this gigantic park called Karlsaue uh, 
would become one of the main sites or the main site for Documenta 13. I, of course, immediately tried to find a way to connect the site to the site of the school, to the campus. And there's only one uh, oval um, clearing in the park that has a path leading out of that oval square towards the canal called Kitchen Canal. But it ends in the middle of nowhere and the temporary bridge basically continues that path. So this, I basically led the people from Documenta onto the campus of the school by literally connecting the two with a temporary bridge. That is the kind of physical aspect. And of course, if one entered the pontoon or the boats, uh, since the center uh, was occupied by the chart, and one has to know that the chart was not grown just loosely inside those barges, but it was uh, planted uh, in, in boxes. So you could basically take away, two people could take a carrier box and one variety of chart away. So it was kind of like a made for delivery, you know, when there's an emergency, you can bring the food or the chart to the people and they can grow their own. But this is very much a metaphor, you know, this is not, uh, this is not about feeding people, this is not about changing the world, it is uh, an attempt to make people think. And when one entered the ferry and entered the boat, immediately the boat would tip towards the person because the weight of the person makes a difference. And it's not a very stable ground, it's a very shaky ground. So in a way, uh, I was, or still hope, that the bridge and ferry transported ideas, not just people and vegetables. People really started to think about uh, you know their their position, and that when when you had one group of visitors entering the boat and it would tip to one side, uh, you would need another group of people to kind of even it out. So they would, you know, one visitor would always feel the presence of another visitor, because you know it. <laughs> this is an, as an, an aspect of the sh of the this work that. I think has to do with a kind of, that might sound strange, but with a, with a kind of body memory. Because when I was here in 1977, uh, walking through the park, I remember vividly a work by George Trackers, and there were two paths, one was in metal, and if um, you would be alone, you would swing, but um, if other people would walk on that elevated walk you could feel the swings and the, the kind of movements from all the other people and there was a crossing where um, the uh, another kind of walk or elevated pedestrian bridge was constructed in wood where you could walk and it would feel stable and the other one on metal sheets you would feel very unstable you would constantly swing and i think this kind of body movements that uh, on the boats, they came from that body memory of, of the 70s of Documenta 6. So did you discover why it's called Swiss chard? I did not. I'm gonna be round my vegetables, I'm gonna chow down my vegetables, I love you most of all, my favorite vegetables, do do. If you brought a big brown bag of them home, I'd jump up and down and hope you'd toss me a carrot. I'm gonna keep well my vegetables caught up in cell, my vegetables I love you most of all, my favorite vegetables. You've been listening to Fresh Talk with Christian Philippe Müller. Read more about Christian and hear other podcasts in this series on freshartinternational.com.